Well, good morning. Welcome to Rejoice Church. Would you stand with us as we start singing? At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone.
He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Amen. Sing this out. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Before you're seated, turn around, shake someone's hand, let them know you're glad to see them. All right, you can have a seat. Thank you so much for being here. Let me uh, first welcome you to Rejoice Church. Uh, lots, of, lots of fresh faces in here. If, or if you're online engaging for the first time, I want to say welcome to you as well. My name is Aaron Pontius. I get to serve as the pastor here at Rejoice Church. And it's a privilege to worship alongside you today. Just a couple of things I want to uh, let you be aware of if you're not already. First off, if you are visiting with us and uh, you feel comfortable, we have some connection cards out these doors and those little tables outside the doorway. Um, if you haven't received one after service, if, you, if you'd be willing to take one of those and fill out whatever information you're comfortable with, I promise you we won't bombard you. Uh, we just want to be able to reach out to you and connect with you in, in some capacity. Or if you are, if this is your home church and you have prayer requests or you have needs that you want us to be aware of, that's also a good opportunity to take those cards and fill that information out. Let us know what we can pray for and reach out to you and help this week in any possible way. Uh, we've been walking through this sermon series called Names of God, and at those same tables we have these free resources for anybody. Uh, we have some books, some of these books left over, so a few more weeks left in this, in this sermon series. So if you haven't received one, make sure you grab them before you leave today. Those are absolutely free uh, for those who want to, to partake in that. And then also, we have this book called Simple, and it says the Christian life doesn't have to be complicated. This is a great resource to, if you have no... Uh, maybe you don't have a direction on what, to, what it means to follow Christ or to have a quiet time with Christ or a, a relationship with Christ. This is a great resource to get you started. And it's as simple as A, B, C, and D. A means for assurance of salvation. B is for baptism, what baptism is and what it means. C is for church and what it means to be a, a part of a community of, of local believers. And the D is for discipleship or devotion, so what it means to, to engage in a time with Christ on a daily basis. So I encourage you to be a part of that. If you, if you want that resource, we have those available to you as well. Coming up four weeks from today will be October the 30th. And we're going to have the Rejoice Fall Festival. We're really excited about this. And, and that's going to be on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. We want to reach the community uh, and also the communities that you guys are placed in as well. We want to be a church that, that 
inside these, these, these doors, inside this building that we worship and gather together. But we also want to be a church that goes outside these doors and outside this building to minister and share the gospel with our community. So there's uh, some opportunities coming up uh, leading up to this. We have opportunities to, to just donate some candy for that evening. But also there's some clipboards at those tables after service. If you want to sign up for something, whether it be bringing some food, some chili, signing up to, to help with the games, uh, to participate in whatever capacity, we encourage you to do so. But mark your calendar. October the 30th, we'll have a, a great evening together as we try to reach our community and be a, be a friend to them. Okay? So let's be praying for that as we get closer to that. And I want to read from Psalm 33 this morning as we continue to worship. It's one of my favorite psalms when it comes to orienting our heart toward worshiping the Lord. Psalm 33 says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. So we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together to worship in your name. Lord, our prayer and our hope this morning is that we have an attitude of worship, a heart of worship, to be open to what the Spirit is going to do in our lives this morning, that as we as we sing these songs that we sing in honor and glory to you, in just a few moments as we open up your word and we, and we learn from your word that the Holy Spirit will, will use it in a mighty way to speak to our hearts and that we can respond in obedience to what your word says. So, Father, we thank you for opportunities like this to gather together as like-minded brothers and sisters who come in with maybe some heavy, week, some heavy weeks or some heavy situations. We come in with baggage, whatever it might be, but we can all together collectively put those things at your feet and trust that you are in control and trust that you are good and trust that you are righteous and our hope in you is a real hope. It's a true hope. It's not wishful thinking, but it is solid. And we thank you for that reality. I pray that you'll be glory, glorified and honored through our worship this morning as we continue. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue in worship? You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory and creation now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater.
What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. Right. Well, at this time, for those who like to participate, our kids can be dismissed for kids worship, nursery or preschool or elementary. If you have not had a chance to check them in at the table by the hallway for security, please do so. We are excited to begin. This is the fourth week of our new sermon series called Yahweh. We've been examining the names of God, and, and we're not looking at every single name of God because that's quite the exhaustive list, and we don't have that much weeks uh, to be able to do that, but we are wrapping this up. Next week will be our final week in this series, but we learned so much so far about studying these various names that have been ascribed to God to describe his, his character and his attributes and all these things, and what we've learned so far when it comes to names, is that a name in the modern context is not a bad thing. That's what we are called, called by. It's what we are referred to and answered to. But in today's context, it doesn't have as much meaning behind it compared to the ancient world. Like in the ancient world, a name ascribed to an individual, it revealed something about the person. Often it represented the person. And then oftentimes it described the very character and the nature of that person. And this was especially true when it came to how God would ascribe names to a prophet or names to the patriarchs of the, of the, 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 the Israel nation. But even when he ascribed it to himself, when he ascribed it to himself, it was revealing an attribute of who he is, a characteristic of who he is. We've learned so many so far. And well, I would be remiss, in my opinion, if I didn't take an opportunity to allow someone that is not myself to speak on the next name we're going to look at today. Um, my wife has actually been studying the names of God for the last decade. And she has been leading women's Bible studies through the names of God for a very long time. And, and I asked her for this particular name, if she would, to testify about what God has taught her through this name over the years. And so you're going to hear from my wife this morning on the next name we're going to learn. And this is something that this is new to her to get up in front of people like this. She's been in small group t settings before, so I know she's going to do good, but I know she's nervous. So please encourage her as she comes up here. I'm going to ask Casey to come up, and she's going to share this next name. Well, good morning. I feel a little like Garth Brooks. I'm not going to lie, you know, like he has a little boom mic. Anybody? Come on. I feel a little. Thanks, Judy. Yeah, you know, like it's. I could sit at the piano and sing. Nobody would want to hear that. Just kidding. So as Aaron said, over the last few weeks, uh, we've been studying the names of God. Uh, and obviously, like he said, this is something that I absolutely love. I can geek out about stuff like this. Aaron can geek out about apologetic stuff. And I geek out about the names of God. Uh, and the reason is because God has shown himself to me through his names and his attributes in a way over the last 10 years or so that I hadn't before in being in church and in being in the word all of my life. Uh, it has been so amazing to see God show himself uh, to me through his word, uh, just learning these things. So I'm thrilled about this opportunity. So over the last few weeks, uh, we started the first week learning about the name Yahweh, uh, Y-H-W-H, which means the eternal one. Uh, and so the Jews would not even say his name because of the reverence that they had for it. And so they would call him Adonai or Jehovah. After that, we learned that Yahweh is also Elohim. He is the almighty God, the creator of all. He spoke us into existence. But not only is he the creator of all, but as the creator... He's sovereign over all. So he is El Elyon. He is God most high. Nothing happens in this world or otherwise that doesn't pass the throne of God most high. 
Isn't that beautiful? He knows what is going on. He is higher and more powerful than any other king, than any other kingdom, uh, and he has dominion over all. And this is how we know that Romans 8, 28 can be true, is that he can work all things for good and for his glory. Last week, we looked at Genesis 17 and the story of Abram and Sarai. Do you remember this? And uh, we recognized him as El Shaddai, or Almighty God. He needs nothing to exist, and he can sustain all things just because he is El Shaddai. But he cares so much for us and is so powerful that he draws us to him, his self, his chest. Remember, this exemplified the word breasted, that he draws us close so that we can have dependence upon him. We also, last week, studied the name Jehovah Shalom, which means the God is peace or the Lord of peace. He doesn't just give us peace. He gives us the gift of himself. He is Peace. So those of us who have trusted in the Lord uh, as our Lord and Savior don't just have peace. We have peace in dwelling within us. It is a part of who we are. It is inside of us because he resides in us. He is our Lord and he is the Lord of peace. And those are a wonderful foundation for what we're going to study this morning. Uh, so like, he, like Aaron has explained, names have uh, a very strong context, especially in biblical terms. It has uh, a depth of character understanding. It is, um, describes attributes of a person. And many of us have nicknames like that. You might be mom or dad. You might be aunt or uncle or grandma or grandpa. You might even be boss or coworker, And these are attributes of who you are to someone else, much like the names of God are to us. We recognize him as our almighty God, as our sustainer, as our creator. Do you see how this works? So when I think about Yahweh, I cannot get past the, the might and the dominion that he has over us. If he really is our creator, shouldn't he have dominion over us? Shouldn't we be able to see him as sovereign over all, that he can use all things? It also points out to me my lack of control, my fallibility, my finiteness, my need of something greater than myself. You know, if just his name has power. And just his words have power. Just his thoughts have enough power to create, to give, to take away. Shouldn't our position be much like Abram in one falling prostrate in front of him of humility? Because we do not deserve to be able to worship him and to serve him, but he allows us to draw near and to know him intimately. Our posture short towards him should be one of worship and adoration. So instead of creating us and then holding his thumb over us, making us like robots, he gives us the opportunity to choose or not to choose. This is what we call free will of him to be the Lord of our life. And thinking about who he is, and we've learned about his character, let's take a look to see what our creator says about us and what he thinks about us as his creation. In Psalm 139, David writes this, How precious are thy thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. Isn't that beautiful? He thinks precious thoughts about you. And about me. Isn't that beautiful? Your creator thinks those things about you. But not only that, he cares deeply for you. Scripture also lays out for us who we are in Christ. And all throughout the word of God, we are referred to as sheep. Let me just point out a few passages throughout scripture. In Isaiah 53, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. In John 10, it says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Psalm 100, know that the Lord or Yahweh is God. It is he who made us. Sound familiar? Elohim. 
and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. In Ezekiel 34, it says, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep, and I look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I after my sheep. And then John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time, how many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, recognizing him as El Elyon, right? You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, we all have nicknames, and probably most of you have a nickname or two. And most of these are based on an attribute of yours, or maybe it was a crazy or a funny encounter. Some of you are smirking, and so I'm feeling like some of you have a name in your brain. Like in high school, my basketball coach called me Moose. I, there's no basis for that. There was no talk about a moose uh, or any animals of any sort at that point in time. But I just ran up on him, and he turned around and kind of pushed me in the forehead and said, Moose, get back out on the court. And I kind of looked around at my teammates, and they're like, did he just call you Moose? Like, what? I ha have no idea. So everyone in high school called me Moose. If you call me Moose now, I probably won't answer to it. It's been a couple years. But uh, there, so everybody, like, enjoyed that encounter and called me Moose through high school. And probably some of you have a similar story. But... Being a sheep is not a very endearing term. Sorry about it. But let's take a zoology lesson and figure out why we might be referred to as sheep throughout Scripture. So, uh, sheep are not very intelligent animals. In fact, uh, here are a few facts about sheep, okay? Sheep cannot locate their own food sources. They will overgraze a piece of land even over a mountainside. If they cannot find more green space, they cannot locate their own food. They also easily fall prey to predators because they are defenseless. They have nothing that they can do except ba at the predator. There's literally nothing they can do for themselves. Sheep can become so depressed and anxious and panicked that they most literally just die. They are so anxious, they die. End of story. There's, there's no defense for that. And they're also subject to pests. So flies, nose flies, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, and they, these things can literally drive them crazy, like drive them away. Here's a short video that shows how intelligent sheep are. Let's watch it again. That's funny. <laughs> I mean, as silly as that is, can anybody relate? Yeah? Okay. Anybody see why throughout scripture we're referred to as sheep? Yep. Uh, it's definitely me right here. Uh, so I thought this sermon was, you know, going to be positive, and uh, it's already hurting my feelings. Um, so why then did God use this metaphor all throughout Scripture? I believe there's a couple of reasons. First of all, it shows us our total and absolute poverty of spirit. And the second reason is to show us our need of a shepherd. K. Arthur says it this way. The welfare of sheep depends solely upon the care they get from their shepherd. Therefore, the better the shepherd, 
the healthier the sheep. You see, we aren't just referred to as sheep all throughout Scripture, but another name of God and the name that we're going to study this morning is Jehovah Ra'ah. Sometimes it's Jehovah Ro'ah or Ra'ah, okay? And this means the Lord our shepherd. Also in Scripture is referred to as the good shepherd. So not just our shepherd, but he is a good shepherd. All of the things about sheep are true for animals that we just went over, but they are also for humanity as well. I relate way more to sheep than I would like to admit, and I'm sure that you do too. Let's look to see how Jehovah Ra'ah provides for his sheep all throughout Scripture. So one of the most recognized passages in the Bible, whether you're a churchgoer or not, is Psalm 23. I'm sure that you have heard this before. If you are a note taker or if you don't mind writing in your Bible, I want you to, as we are reading through this, underline the things that you see the Lord our shepherd does for his sheep. Would you read this together with me? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, we could spend a few weeks in this passage. Uh, Aaron won't give me that, so we're going to have to go through this quickly. But this, uh, along with our zoology lesson, recognizing about sheep and pairing this passage, let's see what we can learn about our good shepherd. Uh, first of all, in verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. We recognize him as our shepherd. And because of this, there is nothing that we lack. This is not like a genie in a bottle type of thing. Your wish is my command. What this means is he is enough. We are his sheep. He is our shepherd. So we lack nothing. He cares for all. Verse 2 sounds just delightful, doesn't it? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Who doesn't want to vacation in a green pasture and next to quiet waters, right? But what we don't understand just from reading this passage is the depth of what this means. So in order for a sheep to lie down, four things must be true. They have to be free from hunger. They have to be free from fear. They have to be free from friction with other sheep. And they have to be free from pests. So how does our Jehovah Ra'ah take care of these things for us, his sheep, just like we can lay, lie down in green pastures? Well, the first of all, let's look at freedom from hunger. If there's a need to find food, the sheep cannot lie down. But also, as we discussed earlier from our zoology lesson, they will overgraze a pasture even over the side of a mountain. But God has given us his word to be spiritually fed. So let's look at a couple of passages of scripture that explain this. Again, in verse 2 of Psalm 23, this, the shepherd has so satisfied the sheep's hunger that they can lie down right in the middle of a green pasture. He provides enough sustenance for us through his word. 1 Peter 2 says it this way, Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And Hebrews 5 says it this way, Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. 
So in other words, we need to be taught how to study God's word, how to interpret it, and not just that, but how to then apply it to our lives. In the church, this word we use, discipleship. That's what that looks like. But as we mature in our faith, we need to be reading God's word and digesting God's word on our own because it is imperative to our spiritual maturity. When our kids were young, uh, specifically Desmond, he really loved food, okay? Uh, And he, so much so that you had to have the second spoon ready to go or he would scream with a mouth full of food because you weren't then ready to give the next spoon. So when he finally got to the age that I was able to hand him his own spoon, he slowed down a little bit, right? But we all get to the point where our kids can have that fork or spoon and feed themselves. Much is true for a believer in Christ. It is spiritual milk that we first take in, that we are taught and discipled how to study God's word, how to interpret it, and how to apply it to our lives. But then we must turn around and take the fork and the spoon for ourselves, and learn how to do it ourselves, so that we can be sustained through the word of God. Much like one meal a week is not going to sustain you physically, one meal on spiritual food on Sunday morning is not going to sustain you spiritually. We have to be in God's word, consuming God's word on a regular basis because our Jehovah Ra'a has provided a freedom from hunger through his word, a spiritual hunger that he can satisfy. The second thing is freedom from fear. In order for a sheep to lie down in a green pasture, they they cannot be afraid. But remember, they are defenseless in and of themselves. So they need a shepherd. But they also cannot be frightened by anything if they are fearful or anxious or even self-doubting. Anybody? Yeah? Anybody relating? Psalm 23 says uh, that sheep fear no evil and they are comforted by the shepherd's staff. 1 John 4 says it this way. And we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Psalm 56, 3 and 4 says, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. Do you see how our Jehovah Ra'ah provides us freedom from fear? Where there is fear and anxiety in our life, the good shepherd gives us his love, gives us his power, gives us his words to overcome. Because sheep that have a trustworthy shepherd have nothing to fear. Perfect love casts out fear. The third thing a sheep needs in order to lie down is freedom from friction. This is tension with another sheep, right? Um, if, if they have tension with another sheep for some reason, like they ate their blade of grass or they feel like they're too close or whatever that might be, they will stay standing up and will not rest. Do you have relationships that have tension? Do you have dissension in relationships? That keep you from resting? Psalm 23, 5 says, The shepherd prepares a table before the sheep in the very presence of their enemies. Of those relationships that have tension and dissension. Man, I want that shepherd. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive other people uh, when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Matthew 5 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. We need to reconcile with others. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, 
Value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So we as the sheep need to do our very best to resolve anything, any issue, any tension between ourself and someone else. And when we are in a relationship like, like that with tension or dissension, we need to ask our good shepherd to lead us through it. We need to approach frictional relationships, what the scripture says, through humility, seeking reconciliation. Our shepherd has given us instructions on how to deal with friction. The fourth thing that a sheep needs in order to lie down is freedom from pests. Let's go back to the discussion about nose flies, okay? So what a nose fly is, is literally a parasite that lays its larva in the nose of the sheep. And as the worms grow, they literally climb up into the head of the sheep. Anybody still thinking about their lunch plans? I think those went out the window, right? These worms will literally drive a sheep batty. It will kill itself banging its head against the ground or a tree or a fence post trying to get rid of what is inside. Anybody like relating to why we're called sheep, right? Because these nose flies, they, they are things that burrow their way in to the head of a sheep and are tormented by them. Anxious thoughts, trauma, hatred, rejection, bitterness, failure, incompetency, greed, you name it. If it consumes your thoughts and sometimes paralyzes you, it's a nose fly. Let's call it what it is, right? The shepherd has given us freedom from this. It says it this way in Psalm 23. The shepherd anoints the sheep's head with oil to protect his sheep from torment. Now, to understand what that oil is, we need to look to scripture. So, how does the shepherd provide us a way to... Be free from pests within. 2 Corinthians 10 says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And here is the oil. We take every captive thought. To make it obedient to Christ. Philippians 4 verses 6 through 9. One of my favorite passages in all throughout scripture. Says this. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation. By prayer and petition. With thanksgiving. Present your requests to God. And the God. Uh, the peace of God. Which transcends all understanding. Will guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus. And this is the filter that I give my boys when, when someone makes a comment to them and it might disturb them. This is the filter that we put it through. What do we know is true? Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice. And the God of peace or your Jehovah Shalom will be with you. Now, this is the oil. This is the toolbox that God, that our Jehovah Ra'ah has given us to anoint our heads with oil. This is defeating the nose fly. So now that we understand that we, we um, connect way too well with sheep all throughout scripture, and maybe your feelings are a little hurt, and maybe you're a little nauseous talking about the nose flies, let's turn and think about Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord, our shepherd. Let's study this passage in John 10 to see what our shepherd does for us. John 10 Verses 1 through 16 says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. 
He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees, they still didn't understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in, of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. That's what this is explaining. Let's look and see what we learn. There is one way to enter the fold, and that is through the door. Those who are in the fold are shepherded by the good shepherd. And the sheep not only hear his voice, but the shepherd calls them by name. He knows them intimately. He knows them individually. The shepherd leads his sheep. He goes before them, but they only follow him because they know his voice. Are we recognizing our need of a shepherd? Jesus here, though, explains about himself that he is the door for the sheep. He is the way into the kingdom of heaven. People who try to enter the fold uh, through him, they will be saved. But any other way, they are considered a thief or a robber. They aren't just saved for, for themselves, but they will also be provided for by their shepherd, taken care of. The good shepherd came that his sheep might have life and abundant life at that. He lays down his life for his sheep, which he did on the cross. This is him in, in telling that he is the gate a shepherd would literally lay down at the entrance of a fold to keep his sheep safe. He would lay down his life so that anyone who wanted to come in would have to go through him. He is the door. He is the gate. Jesus is the gate to the kingdom of heaven. Not only that, but he knows his own sheep. He knows them intimately. He, uh, his own know him just as the Father knows him. And there are some who are not yet in the fold who need to be in the fold. And he is speaking to them, trying to get them to trust him as their shepherd, to not just hear his voice, but to know it and trust their shepherd. They, he wants them to know his care and his leading so that they will become a part of his flock. In contrast, of the shepherd that takes care of his fold and lays down his life for his sheep and knows him intimately, we see the thief and the robber, those that are not a part of his flock, that are trying another way to climb over that fence. They cannot get to the kingdom of heaven except by the door, except by the gate, and Jesus is the door. There is no other way. There is no other way to the kingdom of heaven. These that don't know the shepherd will flee from him because they don't know him and they don't know his voice. But the thief is described here that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Satan wants nothing more of you. Do we see 
the comparison and the contrast between the thief and the robber and the shepherd who is so caring. Verse 12 says, The hired hand who is not the shepherd will flee when danger comes. He will leave his sheep to defend for themselves, and they cannot. They are defenseless, right? But the shepherd stays put, puts down his life, lays down his life for his sheep, and cares for them, and draws them close, and knows them intimately, and calls them each by name, and they know their shepherd. So in closing, we understand that we are sheep. We are desperate. We are hopeless. We are anxious. We are defenseless. We have no hope to enter the kingdom of heaven. We are in desperate need of a shepherd. And not just any shepherd. We need Jehovah Ra'ah, the good shepherd. One who won't run when danger comes. One who will be the door so that no thieves can destroy us, spiritually speaking. We need a shepherd who we can know personally, whose voice we can hear and recognize and follow, that through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit, we can obey. We need a shepherd who's trustworthy to follow all that we need and to lead us wherever he wants us to go. Jehovah Ra'ah is inviting you to be a part of his flock. He wants you to. He has laid down his life in sacrifice for you. If you are part of the flock, lean in and listen to your shepherd. Lean close and know his voice. Dig in his word so that you can be spiritually fed. That you can be free from friction. That you can be free from fear. That you can be free from these pests. If you have a nose fi problem, he has given you what you need in order to overcome. The good shepherd wants to welcome you into his flock. And maybe this is something you have questions about. Maybe this is the first time you've heard the good shepherd explained this way. I pray that you would knock on that door that has laid down his life for you. That he loves you and cares for you. And wants to continue to lead you and feed you to green pastures so you may lie down. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth in your word. Thank you, Lord, that you are our good shepherd, our Jehovah Ra'ah. Thank you for how you care for us. And Lord, even now, if someone is... Um, not in your fold, not a part of your flock, I pray, Lord, that they would seek you now, that they would lean in to your chest and know your voice and be in your word and be fed, that they would be free from fear, that they would be free from friction in relationships, and, Lord, that they would conquer that anxiety or that depression or whatever it is that is going on in their mind, Lord, that we can be led to green pastures and lie down in those. Thank you for being our shepherd. We love you. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Psalm 23 again says, The Lord is my Jehovah Raha. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, As we've all learned this morning and been reminded of is just how incredibly good and kind and gracious Jehovah Raha really is. And um, left to our own demise, well, when we're left alone, we are left to just that, our own demise. And there's nothing we can really do to fend for ourselves, to defend ourselves, to care for ourselves, to even nurture and sustain ourselves. And we might think we can do that in this life and with our own hands, with our own ambition, with our own work ethic, and we can only get so far. But when it comes to the deepest longings of the human soul, only the good shepherd can provide everything that we need, and it's only through him. There's another illustration that Christ gives in the Gospels where he says, wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path to eternal life. And it's often a very puzzling, maybe troubling concept 
in today's maybe modern cult culture. But Jesus is very clear. Now the question is, why is the path so narrow to have eternal life? Well, it's because if there's only one gate and one way in, well, it's going to be a narrow path. Because he says, I am the only way. I'm the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But if every other option makes up this massively wide gate, then it makes sense as to understanding why that road, not just a path, but a road, a highway to destruction is so vast. It's because there's only one where eternal life can be found. It's in the person of Jesus. It's in Jehovah Raha, our shepherd, our good shepherd. So this morning, as we continue in closing out in our worship song this, this morning, we're going to actually sing through Psalm 23. I want to encourage you as we, as we sing this, like let it be a, a prayer of, maybe it's a prayer of thanksgiving. Maybe it's a prayer of just acknowledging the goodness of God in your life. And maybe for some of us in this room or watching online for the first time, you've never really given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've been around Jesus. You've been around conversations about Jesus. You've been around church. And those are all wonderful things to experience. But we can be around the right things, but never actually be within that thing itself, right? We can be around the conversation, but not truly know the person that we're actually talking about. And I want to encourage you. Maybe this is an opportunity that you can go before the Lord and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. If you have questions about that, or if you have just maybe uh, some, some questions about faith, about the Bible, about what you heard today, we would love to encourage you to take your next step of faith. So I invite you to stand, and we're going to close out with this song of worship, and then I'll dismiss us in prayer. Let's sing. Mm -hmm.
seated just for a moment and we're about to dismiss but have a seat again let me just reemphasize: if you have questions about what it means to follow christ or you want to have someone to pray with or uh, just questions about next steps in your faith we would love to encourage you in any way we possibly can uh, we'd love to be available to you after service as well and in closing remind you if you're visiting with us or if you want us to have uh, any information that we can connect with you and encourage you I, I, I encourage you to grab one of these connect cards on your way out if you fill that out and leave it on those tables, we'll grab it afterwards and we'll reach out to you this week to try to encourage you. If you have prayer requests or needs that you want us to be aware of, take advantage of that this way as well. Leave it on the table and we'll reach out to you this week as well. Just want to make sure you guys uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And again, if you, are, if you haven't received one of these little uh, books, Names of God, a great little resource through the sermon series, we have some at those, at those tables after the service. Make sure you grab one, take one home and Make it a part of your personal study this week. It's been very helpful, I know, for me, and I've heard it's been helpful for a lot of you as well. And then again, if you like to have this book simple, uh, The Christian Life Doesn't Have to Be Complicated, I'd encourage you to grab one of these. And if you do grab one of these, if you don't mind, let one of us leaders know, not, not so much so that we uh, just want to control things. We just want to know that you're walking through it. If we can encourage you as you walk through it, we want to be that for you. If you want someone to walk through it with you, we want to be that for you. If you want us just to know so we can pray for you as you're walking through that, we want to do that for you as well. So please, if you want one of those, make sure you let us know, and we'll encourage you to grab one. And then last, or last couple of things, uh, that Fall Festival, Lincoln, put that up there on the slide. The Fall Festival on October 30th, again, if you haven't signed up for an opportunity to serve on that day, there's some clipboards out there on those tables. Make sure you grab one of those and sign up for something. Uh, if, you can, if you can't be there that day, but you can donate some candy for that day, that would be helpful as well. So we receive um, candy donations. We've already received some this morning. We're going to use a lot of that to pass out to all the community that shows up uh, for that day. And then also two weeks from today, we'll be going back into the book of Ephesians. Going to wrap up the, the book study of Ephesians. We started earlier this year, if you remember, if you were part of the uh, things that were going on then. I think it was like February and March. We went through chapters 1 through 3 took a break, and now we're going to revisit the book of Ephesians and go through chapters 4 through 6 between the 16th and, I think, Thanksgiving, and then we'll start a Christmas series. So we'd love to you, for you to be a part of that and put it on your calendar. Uh, that's coming up very soon. And then lastly, before we pray, if you'd like to give uh, back to the, the ministries of this church, we encourage you to do so. You can do it at the collection boxes by the door as you leave or on our website. You can give through our online giving portal. We encourage you, if you feel so led to do, uh, we would be very grateful for that. So. Anyway, we're so glad you're here. Again, my name is Aaron. If I can be of service to you in any way, I would love to. If I haven't met you, I want to meet you before you head out. And uh, let's pray together and you can be dismissed. Father, we thank you again for your goodness and your kindness. God, thank you for the reality that you are our shepherd. And that you are not just a shepherd that we can listen to a voice and we can have some direction. And, but you are the good shepherd where your voice is, is sweet, it is kind, and it is nurturing. It is firm, yet it is gracious. Lord, you're the good shepherd where your advice, your counsel, your wisdom, your navigation is only right. It is never incorrect. It is only always right, and it is always correct. Lord, you, you lead us through green pastures. You give us rest. Lord, there's an abundance all around us, and even with abundance around us through your word, we can still lie down and find rest. So, God, we thank you for that truth. Help us to walk in that this week as we leave here today. Or maybe some of us in this room are online. We don't feel led. We feel very stressed out. We're very anxious about life or about things that are going on in our life. Or maybe this is a reminder that we can go to Psalm 23 and let that be a prayer for us this week. And see all the good things and the blessings that we have simply because you choose to lead us. And you are gracious to do that. And you don't have to, but you choose to. And you bring us into your fold so close to who you are. And you guide us and sustain us and give us life and give us life abundantly. Lord, we thank you for that truth. Help us to operate in that this week. We thank you for all that you've done and what you are going to do. And we bless your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. You guys can be dismissed.